All right. So let's start then. Uh, over the back, can you hear? Can you hear my voice? Right. Thank you. Um, so, so welcome to the first uh, session, the first lecture of of this module. Um, so today, I'm going to make an introduction to the module and the two blocks that um, we're going to be teaching during this semester and the assessment tasks as well a little bit. There's going to be uh, four seminars and the seminars are 100% based on the assessment. So the lectures, except for this one, are um, less focused on the skills that you need to develop to, um, to be able to complete the, assessment, the two assessment tasks. Um, so, um, so the lecture today is organized around those six um, topics or items. So first, what are the objectives of the module? Uh, what sessions uh, we're going to be covering? Um, and then a little bit about the assessment tasks. And for the second part of the lecture, um, we will do some reflections on uh, two aspects that are going to be also important when you are writing your professional report. That's the first uh, uh, assessment task and uh, your information pack. In both cases, you will have to include uh, both risk factors and protective factors. And, and you will also cover uh, vulnerability and resilience. So, so because these are important aspects, it's, it's a good idea to start with them today. Um, so you, uh, whenever you are thinking about one condition, uh, and whenever you're working on that condition, you are also thinking on both risk factors and protective factors. Um, so there are three main uh, objectives or skills that you are expected to uh, achieve during uh, this um, module. To be able to identify and explain um, different types of atypical child development, uh, in all cases, you would need to look at um, empirical evidence and to back up all your information with empirical evidence. So the first seminar that we're going to be doing next week, uh, one of the tasks that you're going to be doing is um, how to search for literature uh, in, in this specific area of expertise and, and how to look at this evidence from the um, clinical point of view. Um, the second objective is to uh, think in these three levels of analysis, um, so biological or, or genetic, and environmental, and then a, in a more social or community-based um, level of analysis. Um, and finally, uh, to understand theoretical uh, models and, and to be able to evaluate them in a critical uh, way, so to, to be evaluative about these theoretical models and, and how they are used to uh, assess or uh, make a diagnosis of, of um, any co condition, uh, but also how they are used in intervention programs um, to uh, tackle uh, atypical child development. Okay, uh, so there's going to be me delivering this session and then next week on developmental language disorder because that's my area of, of expertise is um, language development or language acquisition. Uh, then uh, you will also have um, lectures uh, from Helen and from Lisa. Um, they, um, they are uh, experts on autistic spectrum disorder. Yeah, so, so <laughs> I'm mixing topics here, autistic um, uh, spectrum, um, and, um, and also uh, adolescence. So Lisa really has also publications on other adolescents as well. Uh, we are all based here in, in um, Collegiate Campus. These are our emails. So um, we're going to we'll also uh, be um, going to be your uh, seminar tutors. 
So for any questions that are in relation with the seminars, uh, feel free to, to email us. Uh, and for specific questions on the specific lectures that we're going to be delivering, then just send a message directly to, to all of us as well. Uh, I would appreciate if you also copied me as um, module leader, so I'm aware of, of these questions as well, uh, and, and then I can, um, if it was the case, then I can forward these to, to the rest of the, uh, the group. Um, this is a strange environment to me, I don't know, it's, it's a bit cold, <laughs> but I, I think I will manage it. Um, right, uh, so of course, if you still haven't done it, read the module guide. Um, it, it, it is there. Uh, you, you still have time. This is only the first day if you haven't done it. But uh, I would recommend looking at it. Um, by the way, this is an example of um, how to cite the photography because uh, you make these questions sometimes. And perhaps for the uh, second task, assessment task, you might want to include figures or pictures. Um, so we're not going to be very picky with these things, but it's good to know how these pictures should normally be uh, referenced. So it's, it's a bit like any other publication, so, so you have to cite them as well. And APA 7th um, also um, has, um, there are guidelines about how, how to cite them according to APA 7th uh, style. Um, ideally, you would want to use um, pictures that allow you to reproduce them. So this is not going to be very important in an academic setting as the one that we are here. But it's not a bad idea to start uh, reproducing pictures that allow for it, so that the copyright, there are no copyright issues. Uh, I'll get back to that in the future when we are uh, dealing more with the assessment tasks. Um, so there are two blocks uh, of lectures, and this is important because uh, the first uh, assessment task is going to be uh, based on these um, four topics. There are five numbers, I know, but the first one is actually no, and this is, it is not a condition. So. So we're going to be four. Um, so next week, you will be seeing um, developmental language disorder and dyslexia. And um, it's going to be about um, difficulties that children experience when they are acquiring their, their first language or languages. It's a relatively new um, um, condition. In the past, it used to be called uh, a specific language impairment. Um, but it's not exactly the same as developmental language disorder. But I don't want to get too much into the details today, uh, because uh, there will be more chance for that next week, obviously. Um, And as well, dyslexia, you are probably more familiar with, with this topic because it has a, a longer history. Um, and uh, although both of them are very common, to be honest, uh, but again, I don't want to get too much into it. Uh, this is the one that I'm going to be teaching next week. And then Helen uh, will be teaching um, a lecture on anxiety, depression, and OCD um, in two weeks now. Um, followed by another one on uh, ADHD, uh, ODD, and CD uh, in three weeks now, right? Uh, I think that the next week is going to be, so the, ne so the next week after um, Helen's lecture is going to be a, a reading week, isn't it? And then you will have the privation. Because of these, uh, we are trying to make the final lecture deprivation available online as soon as we can, so that uh, you can use it for your assessment task, um, because it is there. Otherwise, you will have to be waiting up until very close to your um, assessment deadline. 
By the way, also important to bear in mind, uh, the internal validation of the assessment is still being done, so, so it's not 100% uh, approved. I, I hope that it's going to be exactly as it is, uh, and, and I'm confident that it's going to be the case, but I have to remind you that we are still doing the internal validation of, of the assessment. Um, there are not substantial changes with previous um, years, so I'm confident that it will, it will remain as it is uh, now. But it's, I have to, to say this anyway. Well, anyway, of course, any questions, uh, please. I, I, although this context is a bit peculiar, uh, I can see your hands even uh, if you are back in, in the... So there's a good visibility from here. So don't, don't hesitate to, to, to raise your hand and make any questions. Right, so for this block, you will be expected to write a professional report. We're going to get into that a little bit later. And of course, again, in the seminars, you're going to receive specific training on these two tasks. For the second block, however, you will write a different um, assessment task. In this case, it's going to be an information pack. So you will have to provide information that is um, aimed at families. So it's similar to the type of information that sometimes you get from your GP when, when they tell you that you've got this or that condition. And then they say, well, you can download more information from this link, or they just give you a leaflet with uh, more detailed information. I know that is not always the case, but it sometimes happens uh, when you walk out the hospital or, or your um, GP's practice. Um, right, so for this um, second block, there's going to be f one, two, three, five, five um, topics. Um, the first one is going to be delivered by um, Helen. She is also going to deliver one workshop on um, autism. So, so, um, so you're going to have um, both um, together. First, the lecture, obviously, and then the workshop two weeks later. Um, there's there's going to be another workshop, but we are still trying to, to get um, an invited lecturer and and, and we're trying to get something that is directly linked to these. I think it's very good in this, in this module to get um, these first-hand information from practitioners, not just from lecturers. Um, Helen is also she is an associate le lecturer, so she's, also, uh, so she's in direct contact with, with uh, these practices as well. Um, then Lisa is going to teach this lecture on child abuse and neglect. Uh, and then, again, we're trying, we're aiming to produce these three lectures uh, recorded. And I'm confident that we're going to do it so that you have these three topics available uh, on recorded, recorded lectures. Um, therefore, you can um, prepare them with enough time before your uh, assessment date before your deadline. Um, so this is going to be on disfigurement, premature babies, and uh, neurodevelopmental uh, conditions, in this case, uh, intellectual disability and giftedness. Okay, so for all of them, you would choose one. Um, you would narrow this topic. Uh, so it's not just going to be autism, but something uh, within this area. Uh, and you would produce uh, an, an information pack aimed at um, a, a family. Um, whereas the professional report is not aimed at a family, but a group of professionals. Right? Uh, next week we will see, in the seminar, we will see more details about what do we mean by a group of professionals. Um, so, Four seminars in total, two focused on the first assessment task, 
during the previous, during the first seminar, um, you will start to, uh, you will be introduced to the professional report, so you will be starting to be familiar with this type of text that you probably haven't read uh, very much in, in the previous years. Clearly, you haven't written these types of texts. You, you were producing more uh, essays than uh, professional reports. But in reality, uh, when you are working, it's very rare that you're going to be writing an essay. It's more common that you're going to be writing a professional report. So it's, it's good to start uh, being trained in these types of texts uh, before you get into your jobs. Um, so, so this first seminar will be an introduction to these, these texts. Uh, you will start searching for articles that you will be using for producing your professional reports. Um, and hopefully you will start to think about writing plans, meaning basically choosing a topic that uh, you might start to be leaning towards. But it, I know that it's very early, so, 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 uh, so you, you are not expected to walk out of the first seminar with a writing plan in your pocket, to put it like that. Um, but it would be good if you write of, out of your second seminar with a writing plan in your pocket, meaning that then you can start writing your professional report. Not the first seminar, but the second one. Right? There's four of them, so the first two seminars will be on, on task one, professional reports. Um, and then two more on the information pack. Again, what do we understand? What do we mean by an information pack? Um, Again, searching for articles that you could be using and, and a writing plan for your information pack. Um, so, it's 1,600 words, uh, the professional report. Um, you have to identify a number of salient ideas, salient issues within one condition. So, Let's start with developmental language disorder because it's the one that you've got next week. So what, what is worth knowing for that condition? What is important for professionals to know? Because you're going to be focusing in one audience, that is going to have an effect on the salient topics. So let's say that you are interested in um, GPs uh, as a profession. So doctors. Um, so that's going to have an impact on the type of important things that they need to know about developmental language disorder. So for instance, how many words do we expect to, um, to be using for a two-year-old child? So what's normal for a two-year-old child? How many words? Uh, how many uh, words do we expect them to combine, to put together? Uh, is it two, three words? Um, how many words do we expect them to understand so that the GP could um, um, make these questions to parents or even during the practice uh, find out about these possible signs of something going wrong? Uh, instead of that, it could be say that we are... Um, interested in police or judges or something in the legal system, why would they know, need to know something about developmental language disorder? Well, maybe because they have to interview children and, and because DLD is quite a common condition affecting 7% of the population. So it's one of the most frequent conditions nowadays, um, slightly behind dyslexia. Because of that, they would, not, they would need to know about this condition and what happens when they have to interview a child uh, that has been diagnosed with DLD. Um, so the professional report has to be written with these audience in mind. Um, and um, because of that, you have to be careful with the words that you are using. So for instance, if you're writing for... Um, um, a GP talking about DSM-5 is probably fine because they know about it. But if you are writing to a policeman, so 
talking about DSM-5 is probably not a good idea because they don't know what it is about. So you will have to explain these, um, these constructs, these things like DSM-5. Um, right, also, the professional report has to include a critical uh, um, exploration. Uh, the way that you're going to get this critical exploration is uh, we're going to be seeing in the seminar again, but it's mainly by contrasting different views on, on, these, um, on the chosen topic. So how different studies have found contrasting evidence, for instance. Um, all professional reports must include um, risk factors and protective factors. Um, and finally, there's going to be a concluding uh, statement. Um, so, just today to have a general idea about what is involved in, in uh, the first task, the professional report. Any questions at this stage? Right, okay, fantastic. There will be questions, obviously, but it was probably not there. Uh, the moment now, uh, gradually, as you are being fed with more information, you will have more questions to make, obviously. Right, the second uh, task is an, an information pack. Um, I've already talked about it. Uh, it's a bit longer, but in return, it gives you more credits for your final grade because it, it accounts for 60% of your final um, mark. So it's 40% is the professional report, 60%. In previous years, uh, we've noticed that, I mean, you do well in both of them, but perhaps in the information pack a little bit better as well. So, but obviously there are individual differences, but, 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 uh, but both of them tend to be very interesting because I think these, they are types of texts that, that you haven't produced before and that, that makes it interesting. Um, so I was saying all the time, um, families as a general audience, we could say parents, you could also think about friends or relatives or perhaps even teachers or TAs so, in essence, people working or living directly with children, nurses as well, in, I mean nurses in, in, in uh, uh, education, like not as in medical nurses, but okay, working in uh, infant schools. Right, so with these, I've um, covered the first half of this session. And so um, the objectives of the module, the schedule of sessions, and uh, the assessment. So I'm trying to record this. I'm, I'm making sure that everything is fine. Um, right. I don't, I don't expect today's session to be two hours long. Um, Next session probably will be a bit longer, and if that's the case, then I will make a break, uh, because two hours is probably too much, a break, 10 minutes, something like that, maybe eight minutes, and then, uh, but today I think it's probably better if we just do it like that. Or we can negotiate that next week, so you can tell me whether you prefer a break or just all uh, as a whole, uh, but we will do that next week, right? See how, how we're feeling. It, it is a difficult time. I've, I've tried to change it um, two, three times, but it was really difficult to change this. Uh, uh, and finally, here we are. Right, so, um, so first let's, let's think about the idea of atypical. So um, what do we mean by atypical? And um, before we get into the theory, I, I would suggest you to think about your um, personal experience with children. Um, so uh, children that you know around, um, 
all children are different, all humans are different, we all have different needs. In some cases, they might be more obvious, in some cases they might be more hidden, but we all have different types of needs. So try to think about one case, could be your brother, your nephew, or just a friend, a neighbor, whatever, try to think about it, so that while we are going through the risk and protective factors and the idea of atypical, you are thinking about this child, uh, no matter whether it's a newborn, three years old, five years old, um, so you can think about this child all the time while we are going through the lecture. Um, also think about something that maybe you are less directly familiar with, but you are interested in. So think about this child first, and then think about one possible condition that for any reason uh, is inter you are interested about. Something that is more in the atypical side of things, so not something very common, something. It could be whatever, dyslexia or uh, autistic spectrum disorder. So think about one of these um, conditions and one child. So while we are thinking about risk, protective factors, you can try to find examples in connection to this child and this condition. Right, so during the whole module, we're going to be seeing these three levels of um, pathology. The more, so the closer to the body would be the biological uh, level, then we're going to have the cognitive level as well, and finally the, the so social or cultural level. This is important because the causes, the diagnosis, and the intervention are going to work at these three levels as well. And the way that we understand the risk and protective factors as well, they are going to be working at these three levels too. Um, something that I would like you to get today, is one a very important idea that we'd like you to get, is that there's nothing that we can do at an individual level. So in any uh, type of um, condition, we, we, we need to be working at more than just um, the individual level. And the reason for this is basically because uh, the way that we understand something atypical is always beyond the individual level. There's always this interplay be between um, the, the cultural understanding of a condition and, and, and the biological factors um, in these conditions. So, so this always going to be a continuum of normality. There's never going to be discrete, either GS or no, or you got it or you haven't got it. There's always going to be, you, so, so you're go always going to be moving in, in different points within this condition. And all the uh, risk risks and protective factors are going to push in the person in, into uh, one side or another one. Um, so, because you were thinking about one particular child and one particular condition, think about how um, you could consider whether this child is moving in, in, in these continuum, within these continuum. Uh, for all the slides, you've got um, some references that normally would work by clicking. So if you want to, to get more information on, 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 on what I'm mentioning there, you normally could click there and then get, get an, an article. Right, so the other way around also is, is it makes sense. So it's, uh, it's actually not normal, always atypical. Think about examples of uh, situations where there's no need of treatment after a disorder. So we could have a disorder, but we don't need to treat it. So we could have something that is biological, bi biologically salient, that is there biologically, but there's no need for treatment for any reason. Think about uh, the other way around. So when there's no obvious function that is damaged, but we need treatment there. So there's also uh, so, so, so basically, the, the difference between a biological factor and the need of treatment is normally very, very uh, clear. 
think about all the problems that shouldn't be considered pathologies. So I've mentioned three of them, or four. So sadness, anxiety, stress, boredom. We're going to be living within uh, these continuum with different levels of uh, anxiety, stress, boredom, uh, but none of them are per se, on, it, on themselves, uh, pathological. So, um, so all of this is um, included into this model um, called the harmful dysfunction analysis uh, by Wakefield in 1992. It, it's a very influential model, uh, so you can, you can also see a review in, in Smith to 2022. Um, I think it's especially interesting for you to uh, get this idea about the difference between psychiatry and psychology. Uh, you are not um, doctors, uh, you are psychologists, and um, we live in a clear interdisciplinary world, world where, where we want to um, know about other areas of expertise. But when you are preparing your professional reports, you have to go beyond the purely medical information. You have, and, 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 and you can go beyond that if you think about the psychosocial um, aspect or approach to these conditions. That typically is not easy or possible for uh, doctors. Right? I'm, I'm not trying to say anything negative about doctors. I'm just saying that they have the area of expertise and it's, it's difficult for them to understand um, in some cases, um, the functional consequences of any biological factor. So sometimes they just get stuck to the biological <laughs> situation uh, because you know they, they, there's, there's uh, no resources, no time, and, and, and just a different goal uh, for them. So you have to be careful when you're writing about things like you know whatever disfigurement or um, whatever you choose, any of the topics. Um, and, uh, and your role is to um, include the um, functional problems that children might be facing and what protective and risk factors we can provide. Um, sometimes this would involve uh, getting into the social de debate on what's uh, causing, for instance, uh, deprivation. Uh, so how, uh, well, we're going to see it in the next one. <laughs> um, so this book, um, so, so far, I mean, all, all the references that you've got are uh, journal articles. This, this one is, is a book. This, this book is, um, is a very good way of uh, putting ACD in context from a psychological point of view. Um, so there are 10 different factors that we might consider. Uh, we've got age and gender, so the sooner we um, get information about one condition, so for instance in DLD, obviously, children are learning their uh, first language, the sooner we detect uh, developmental language disorder, the sooner we're going to, to be making an intervention. And it's critical because if you wait too much, then the effects are going to be uh, life lasting. Uh, so um, gender is another factor to, to, to bear in mind. Um, and obviously, this requires a contemporary approach um, in both cases, in, gender and ge uh, in age and gender. Um, another, I've, I've been mentioning all the time uh, a continuum, but intensity and frequency. So. Um, Dyslexia is another case, it's very clear, so you know that there are different levels of intensity. Some children really struggle, it's very, very difficult to decode and encode a series of letters. Uh, other children have more problems, more at the, at the level of text comprehension. Um, what do we mean by continuity, discontinuity? If you think, uh, let's think about another example, um, uh, abuse, for instance. Um, of vulnerability caused by uh, social factors like um, um, a war, for instance, 
So for how long have children been um, kept away from their families or their homes? Um, is it a month? Is it a year? Is it two, three years? Um, they might, living in, might be living in camps. So for how long they have been experiencing this? Um, whether it's in a specific situation is well defined or it's a range of contexts that are taking place. Uh, how much control can we have over that specific situation, for instance, can be solved with adoption, if, 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 if that was the case, or, um, or, or not, because it's, it's more community-based, so the problem is, uh, is, is, is harder to isolate. Um, socioeconomic and cultural factors, how the context where the child is growing is understanding that particular condition. Uh, so if we think about developmental language disorder again, so it's something that um, in the past was not really something that um, people were concerned about. So because at the end of the day, we all acquire a language. So it's, very, so, so it's true that some children struggle more, We've always known that, but at the, end, at the end of the day, so that was the idea kind of three decades or two decades about, um, two decades uh, ago, that sooner or later children will acquire a language. So why should we be worried about it? Now, when we know that actually uh, what we have been diagnosing as ADHD, where in many cases uh, children that were struggling to acquire the language within the normal um, pathway, the normal rhythm, then um, we are kind of like getting one step deeper into solving these problems of attention. Uh, children that are, are just being naughty all the time because essentially they are not understanding a single word of what is being told to them. So the only way that they uh, can communicate or get attention from others is just being naughty. Um, so, um, so I'm just giving an example of, of a cultural factor that um, now, nowadays uh, there's, more, there's a growing uh, concern about language, uh, whereas in the past the concern was most about, about discipline, uh, behavior, conduct. Um, right, again, severity, number, and diversity, that's going to affect a, a child. Unfortunately for some children, if it's a rare case, uh, there's going to be less resources, less uh, understanding as well, or it might be the other way around, maybe because it's more kind of exotic, more, um, uh, more salient as well. Uh, so this is another factor to, to, to consider. Um, what type of behaviors are involved? Uh, in some cases, that might be hidden, as I was uh, mentioning with developmental language disorders. So people might just be more focused on the actual um, behaviors that the child are showing, not at the language level, but whether they are just being a pain in the classroom um, and not so much on, on the level of language that the child is acquiring. Because it's harder, isn't it? Um, um, how, how behavior is changing um, as well. Um, again, I was suggesting you to think about specific condition, but also specific child, um, if you follow this child for a time, whether the child is changing. Um, life events, we're going to be seeing how we understand life events at different levels, but it could be more at an individual level, so it could be something that is happening to the child, but also to the family or to the community where the child is living. Um, and, um, and the relationship to, to other um, conditions or people with other conditions. So, in essence, it's very general what I'm presenting here, but these are factors that would be very helpful when you are preparing your professional report, because uh, ideally, if you can cover all these 10, 10 factors, you would be writing a very uh, powerful professional report, and so you could think about any of the, of the conditions that you're going to be writing about and try to tick all these uh, uh, factors in the list. And of course, you can also go to the actual book and, uh, and find them in, in more depth. Right, so I'm talking a lot. I know there is a lecture, but 
if anyone wants to give me an example um, of any of these like type of behavior, change in behavior, um, Yes. Um, well, my sister, she had a speech impediment when she was a kid. They didn't know what it was at all. And in the end, they actually blamed me. And they said I talked too much. So it caused a problem with her. But she used to like to flash out. But she never did it at school. So it's sort of like all links. Because right. like, at home, she felt sick, but she couldn't get her words out. So, yeah. Right. Uh, so w w let, let's go, for instance, for, for, for eight. <laughs> so, uh, that's an important factor, I think, in this no, case. About one and a half. One and a half when... The, when when uh, she was just starting to talk. She so was starting to talk, and, and at that point, people probably didn't... There was a lot no you, one understood her. Because her sister was very talkative. Mm -hmm. So they would say, well, you know, they, she's just... Uh, all right. Mm -hmm. um, do any, any time people mention something about gender? Because it's not rare that people... Well, they thought that... They said, oh, well, it's unusual because there's no, like, hearing problem in this, that, and the other, and she's a girl, so we just think that it's probably more so a sister. Ah, oh, right, so okay. So it was like, okay, thanks. Because she's a sister. If it was a brother, maybe it would be a different story, isn't it? Like, so, so the way that these things are conceptualized uh, are, are, are very important. Uh, at a family, group, community level. Um, so typically, also girls are expected to speak t talking earlier. So they are expected to... Uh, so that's... That's something that is a problem for boys because uh, if, if in the family they say like there's two uh, two girls and one boy and the boy is not talking very much, that maybe the family would say, well, but it's normal, isn't it? Because the other are girls and he's just a boy. But he might have developmental language disorder, uh, but it's, it becomes undiagnosed just because of the context. Um, and then, yeah, there were these cultural factors, socioeconomic, um, the type of behavior. So, so basically, you treated all, all the possible factors um, in, in this case. Um, any other examples? Yes. Yeah, it makes all sense. Uh, I think it, it, it's um, intensity and frequency. So when you say hitting, obviously uh, a little bit is a lot. But, uh, but, but yeah, so uh, it's also how it's perceived by the, by the community, how you can be overprotected as well. Um, and I'm, so, I'm not, by all means, I'm not saying that hitting a child is, is something that, um, but, 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 and if, if you have to, so you are, so let's say that it's not clear to you whether you are overprotecting or underprotecting the child, it's, if it's unclear, it's always better to go for the overprotection than the underprotection. So, so, so uh, obviously it's a very Anglo European centric maybe approach, but, um, but yeah, so severity um, is very clear there as well. So, so uh, how it's also perceived, not just by the community, by, by, by the child. Is it perceived as something very important or something um, less important? Um, uh, what do you mean exactly by hitting? Is it just uh, uh, kind of like, I don't know. <laughs> but it could, it, could be, it could be damaging at a, at a psychological level or just being a, a game, a rough play between typically fathers and children, sometimes, uh, you know, it becomes like, it's like, well, because it's a sport, we can hit someone because, because we're just playing a sport here. So, so it, there's a lot of hypocrisy also over there. So, um, but yeah, overprotection is, is a very important factor um, now, I think, because, because obviously children don't realize uh, that they have to, oops, they have to 
uh, work and fight to, to get things uh, going. Uh, okay. So, um, plasticity. Uh, this is more... Um, I think in this case it's clear that it's purely psychological. Um, so, so the brain is just an organ to acquire culture. I think that's the way I see it. That's the way that is perceived by most psychologists now. So we might have other organs to do other things, but the brain is just kind of like a sponge where you get culture. You build culture inside uh, the brain. Uh, and the way that, that it does is just by having many um, neurons that are initially not organized. Um, so they gradually become organized. Initially with more basic functions, like to talk, perhaps, or to walk. So very basic functions. Uh, and they gradually specialize more and more. So, um, so the system is organizing themselves. And there are two important processes here. One of them is redundancy. So some uh, skills that the brain, the brain is acquiring can also be used for similar tasks. So, so functions can be duplicated. So face recognition can be used perhaps for letter recognition if they share um, processes. So the same area of the brain that already had that uh, ex expertise can be used for these parallel functions as well. The problem is that sometimes you need to reorganize things because you are acquiring new um, functions. Um, so that's where the idea of module makes sense. So because you already have built a module to produce or to be uh, successful in one function, then um, you can't really use that module for a completely new function. So sometimes that means that you have to disassemble your learning and reassemble it. And if you think about these Lego blocks, uh, let's imagine that you have already built a very advanced, how would you call that, a very advanced um, sculpture, a very advanced uh, set or kit you would have to disassemble all the pieces one by one if you want to do something completely different. So what it will happen with plasticity is that normally you would take groups of blocks that are already assembled and then you will try to make them work with different purpose, with a different function. So that's the reason why I have this strong accent because I, I started learning Spanish and, and then I, I had to start using a different language. But my brain had lost plasticity because it had specialized, specialized itself in, in some phonemes, in some um, combinations of words. So I can't uh, completely, my brain can't uh, put apart of the small blocks. Uh, they are already glued together. So there's no way for me to dismantle uh, all those blocks and use them with a different function. I don't know if the metaphor is working, uh, but uh, I think I'm, I'm confident that that's what happened to my uh, ascent. Uh, so there's, there's no way back uh, in my brain because the, the, the system is already organized. Uh, so the neurons have, uh, are now sold. Did you say no? So like, uh, yeah, like, yeah, solid, yeah. So, so, um, so that's what I was trying to... Um, so obviously when you're thinking about a typical child development, uh, this has implications for timing. So, so the sooner you get uh, to help the child, uh, the better. Um, on the other hand, it's also important to be aware of uh, redundancy because maybe you can use functions that are already working uh, to use them with a different purpose. Uh, as long as they are uh, parallel, they are similar, they have processes in common. Um, so yeah, so we have to be aware that not all developmental trajectories can be uh, readjusted because of plasticity. 
Um, and, and of course, this genetic endowment, um, traditionally, we think about genetic endowment in the upper left um, approach or way of thinking, so that we come to life with a, a genetic architecture. So we, we have that from factory, so we have that hardware, to put it like that. And then the environments make shape to um, that um, hardware to produce behaviors and, in some cases, pathologies. However, this is a very simplistic way of understanding the interaction between um, the genetic endowment and the environment. And more recent uh, approaches, like the one that you've got by Hyde in 2015, uh, say that it's actually um, an interaction between environment and, and the neural structure. So if you think about the previous example that I've mentioned, really when you are receiving uh, experience from the environment, you are transforming your brain and there's no way back for some processes. So, 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 so that's why the, the lower part of the, the figure uh, is proposing uh, a, a a bidimensional or both ways uh, interaction between genetics and environment. Because um, your experience is changing your brain in such a way that there's no way back. So, so behavior and psychopathology are going to be mutually uh, affected by um, your genes and your environment. Uh, so it's not like first genes, then environment, and then pathology. So. It's going to be like genes, environment, biological structure, environment, and uh, pathology. <coughs> in essence, when you are talking about the genetic factors in uh, your professional report and information pack, you are expected to go beyond these uh, initially genetic factor, then environmental uh, factors. Uh, and try to um, understand how these environmental factors might have caused structural changes that are re not reversible, that are irreversible. Is that the right? Irreversible? Yeah, okay. Right, questions here, comments? Okay. So, um, these two important words, vulnerability and resilience. Um, so, vulnerability is going to be associated with risk factors. In essence, it's going to be the result of all these risks. Whereas, resilience is going to be associated with the protective factors. And they are going to be used pretty much as synonyms. So many protective factors are going to, um, at the end of the day, be called resilience. Um, so by vulnerability, obviously, uh, we're going to be thinking about challenges, uh, problems at these three levels of analysis again. So at the biological or genetic uh, level, at, at the environmental level, and at the uh, psychosocial uh, level as well. Um, this, in many cases, is going to be a threshold so that when you go beyond that amount of uh, risks, you end up with a condition, with something that is uh, unbearable for uh, the child. Um, you got that definition of uh, vulnerability there by, by Luxton uh, and colleagues, and, and you've got the paper as well there. Uh, dealing with uh, vulnerability. I'm not going to get too much into, into the details now. I'm going to treat all these three levels uh, in, in the next slides, so biological, environmental, and psychosocial. Um, and then finally, at the end of the lecture, we'll see a little bit more on, on protective factors and resilience. Um, but uh, they're going to be analyzed in a similar way. So first, within the child. So what can the child do? To, to avoid um, problems. Uh, what can the immediate context the family do? 
So if you are familiar with Bronfenbrenner, have you heard about this guy? Bronfenbrenner? Right, it's uh, in development. Some, some of you were mm, nodding, some of you were uh, not. Uh, so uh, in developmental psychology and level four, uh, you probably have a little bit about it. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be back to it because it's important for, for this uh, resilience. Uh, understanding resilience. Right, uh, as I was saying, I'm not going to get too much into the biology of things. Um, uh, I think that there are three moments, so the genetics, so pre-birth, uh, something that you came with your parents. And so it's not your fault, but it's your parents uh, to blame. And, and it could be, there are, there are many, many concepts that uh, that you know, you might remember or not, or be familiar with them or not. Uh, I, as I say, I wouldn't get too much into the detail unless you are dealing with a condition that requires information about it. Uh, in many of the conditions, this is not going to be very uh, relevant. In some conditions, there might be a biological factor or genetic factor, but it's largely unknown. Um, like, you know, autistic spe spectrum disorder as well. So, 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 so we know that there might be something there, but it's difficult to really get into the actual um, problem with the genotype. And there's also this, this, this always funny difference between genotype and phenotype. I don't know if you remember this distinction, but it, in reality, what happens is like there's a lot of uh, information, uh, there's like too much information. And not all this information is used when the proteins are being built. So, so when the genes are used to build the body, the body, not, not all the information is used. Only a segment of the information is used. But also, what happens is that uh, there are errors while the information is being encoded. So, so while the body is reading the genetic information in order to use it to build uh, proteins, sometimes there are errors as well. So this makes a difference between the genotype, so the genetic information, and the actual results of the genotype. So with the same genotype, you can have different bodies, to put it like that. Even identical twins are not completely identical. Uh, but anyway, so, so, uh, so you know, the, this is important because basically there's not going to be one unique case that can be explained just by genetic factors. Right, um, prenatal, uh, peri perinatal. So it's difficult to, to be born. And so during labor can be also be accidents. And it's a difficult situation. Oxygen is, is very important. And, and, uh, and that can cause things that go beyond the biological factor. What I like is this idea of uh, fixed markers of risk, that it goes beyond the genetic conditions. Uh, so things like your gender, or your age, or your ethnicity, or family structure, they, they are fixed, so you can't play with them. Um, they are not exactly biological, they are not exactly genetic, but there are things that you can't easily change. Obviously, you can change your gender, your cultural gender, your social gender, but your biological gender is going to be there. Um, I mean, gender is, is, a, is, a, is a changing construct, right? But um, age is the same, so you can try to, to, uh, to look younger, but you're going to be aging <laughs> every day. You are one day older, no matter what you do. Um, ethnicity as well. I mean, your background is going to be there all the time, uh, supporting you, but also uh, playing with you. Uh, bad tricks as well. So, um, so these, these ideas in relation to um, the biological factors, but they are not biological, right? They are just fixed. And that's the way that they are understood. Right, okay, environmental things. I'm not going to, because it's so, there's such a wide range of environmental factors, uh, and I think it's quite clear for you what, what they mean. Uh, what, because environmental basically means non-biological, uh, so due to experience. I just brought four scales. 
And this is the way, because it's really difficult to measure environmental uh, factors, environmental risks. Um, so I just wanted to, um, to show you how it has been measured in the past. Uh, so we've got first this um, neighbor, neighborhood perception scale. Sorry, there's a typo there. It should be 2002, not 2022. I just realized there's a typo there. Um, well, it's clear in the, in the reference anyway. Uh, yes, sorry, maybe because it was 2022 when I was writing it. But um, so, so how do we measure um, your neighborhood? So we can ask people, how do you understand your neighborhood? So in this case, how likely is it that you could ask a neighbor to loan you a few dollars of some food? It's going to be hard in England, um, <laughs> but maybe people still have some dollars um, at home. I, I, sorry, I, I wasn't trying to make a joke or something. I was just thinking about the dollar versus pound. Nothing um, going beyond, honestly, nothing going beyond that. <laughs> well, okay, yeah, now that you say that, but it's probably worse in America, um, who knows, uh, but I mean, so, so yeah, there you are, so, so trying to get uh, to see how much you are in risk or, or, or your neighbors can be protecting you, uh, it's really difficult to measure, so environmental factors are going to be difficult, they are very important, but when you put it, when you want to put numbers in them, it's going to be difficult. Then we got the, the child self-report post-traumatic post stress reaction index. Again, how children are perceiving uh, a traumatic experience. Uh, that's an old scale, but it's, it's been used a lot. Um, the antisocial behavior scale and the brief sensation seeking scale. So um, in your free time, uh, try to click on those links and see how, how they work. They, they, they are uh, different ways of understanding risk factors from an environmental perspective. Any questions here? Or? Right, okay. So let's move on uh, to the psychosocial. And this is what I was meaning about Bronfenbrenner, because basically that's a uh, Bronfenbrenner model. Um, so there are Four and a half levels. Um, the first one is the microsystem. That's where the child is touching and having direct interactions with other people. That's the, micro, the child's microsystem. So think about the newborn child just with their mom and maybe someone else living in the house. But hopefully at least the mom. Um, so this this child will have that microsystem. There might be other members of the family, of course. There might be siblings. There might be a father. There might be two mothers. I don't know, but that that would be the uh, microsystem. So that um, direct interaction. Um, and then there's going to be an exosystem when the child goes to school uh, and when the child goes to um, the supermarket, I don't know, it goes to Morrison's and, and then there's, um, there's uh, a woman at the cash <laughs> or a man at the cash, uh, cashier, is it? Uh, and, and then the child realizes that he's taking something out of the trolley. Uh, so the child cries, like, you know, it was for us, not for you, or, or whatever happens. So the child starts to realize that there are different ways of doing things outside home. Um, and, um, and imagine now an, a child in the, con in the context of an atypical child development, how uh, this condition is perceived at the micro system level in the family, and it is perceived uh, at school or in the supermarket. And finally, the community. So there are different values. We've, we've talked about them. We've, we've mentioned a few examples where different values from the community could mean different uh, things for the child. Uh, we've, we've seen two, two very good examples here. Um, but think about your own examples, what I was at the beginning suggesting you to do that. 
Uh, you've got two examples here, very recent, uh, and I think very clear. I, th I think they are perhaps a little bit in relation with uh, what you were saying from South America. In this case, it's China and India, uh, and unintentional child injuries. So children living in, in rural areas, mainly, um, and you know, when you live in a rural area, with things happen, and they are different to what happened. They happen in, in, in an urban area. Uh, so it has to be due also with overprotection or underprotection of children, um, and how your, you can work at a micro or meso uh, level. Questions here? Yes. That this great, I have no idea. Community policy is this No, you can play it on me there, 80. Community policy is this. An anti A to OD. Use messages in media. I don't remember. I don't know. We have to check that. And then we have to write it in the, um, under the, yeah. It's um, alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs. Oh, of course, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah how it's perceived, obviously, in the community. So alcohol, tobacco, very American, that thing, yeah. <laughs> well, drugs, yeah. So, um, right, okay. Uh, obviously, it's going to have. So, think about any of the samples, children that you're thinking about, uh, topics that we're covering here: disfigurement, uh, abuse. Um, so, right. Uh, this is a good tool. It's, it's relatively new. It's only one year old. Not even one year old. Uh, and it's a repository of functions that the ICD. Um, so it's. it's I don't know if you have heard about the ICD, so you've probably heard about DSM. So who knows about DSM here? Good, and ICD? Uh, similar, because it's very similar, isn't it? So the DSM is uh, built by the American Psychiatric Association. So it's these uh, American psychiatrists trying to produce something for the universe. And so they write these books every five or six years saying, so they try to produce these universal um, descriptors. But obviously this is problematic because we've seen this macro system, micro system. So the World Health Organization tries to do something similar as well. Uh, so, um, so they have this ICD. They, they are now in the 11th version, but they are similar. Um, um, it's, it's very similar to the DSA. Put it like that. But in this case, it's about functions. So it's quite good to define functions. Because when we're talking about something like memory or emotions or learning or motor or language, what do doctors understand by that? So what do doctors understand by, by, by learn or attention? So try to do that. Try to go to that link and search for them. And you will find very brief definitions of those functions. And this could be helpful when you're writing your professional report, but also your um, um, information pack. Um, and you will always, always cite the ICD-11, of course, if you use them. Um, right. Uh, we can give it a try, I don't know. Uh, let's see if it works. Uh, so... So let's search for language and, and you've got all these subtypes uh, so sub functions so there's the main function of language and then you've got many many different like for instance uh, reception of body language um, expression of language it could be expression of sign language or expression of written language uh, and for all of them uh, you're going to have a very brief definition. When it's very specific, it's going to be very short. When it's um, slightly more longer, when it's more general. Um, 
Um, so, of course, you have something for, say, vision, um, visual perception, quality of vision, color vision, for instance, so color blindness, and so on. Uh, okay. So, finally, um, resilience. Um, so, it's the capacity to adapt, and um, it's that it, it's, it can be seen in two different ways. So the absence of, of a problem, uh, the absence of a pathology, it would help, it would protect someone. So as simple as that. So when someone has not, hasn't got this problem, it will be protected against something. Um, but also, it can be seen from a positive way, like being able to achieve something. So being able to, so absence of problems and um, steps towards protection. Um, so there's a tendency to see that everything depends on the individual child. That's obviously not, not the case. There's also a tendency to, to think that nothing depends on the child, and that's, again, not the case. So we ha again, we talked about overprotection and underprotection, and so we have to normally try to see where's the balance between um, making everything depend on the child and making nothing depend on the child. Is there a price to pay for resilience? Yeah, so you also have to think about uh, how much we're investing in this protection. Uh, because normally it requires training, resources, uh, and it's going to be very important when you write in your professional report, like policies. So you have to talk about pre prevalence. So how many children have the, the condition in order to uh, so when you are suggesting some, making some recommendations, uh, you have to think about what's the price to pay for resilience. Right, so, um, so Fergus and Zimmerman have these six uh, models of uh, resilience. The first one is the compensatory one. It's like, it's not very optimistic. It's like, we find that there's a link between poverty and crime. So let's try to reduce poverty so we reduce crime. But we know that we are not going to be able to um, kind of like completely uh, get rid of crime. There's always going to be different levels of crime. So the more uh, we reduce poverty, the less crime we're going to have. So it's, that's, that's kind of the compensatory uh, model of resilience. And I mean, if you speak to, you know, perhaps any, I've, I remember speaking to one policeman, I think I was talking with one of you before, uh, but uh, so he was like in charge and he was saying, well, it's basically poverty. I mean, if we were able to reduce poverty, we would be able to reduce crime. But anyway, um, and the other one is, um, protective resilience, not compensatory. So parents, in this case, so we train parents, or we work with parents, maybe we can reduce crime uh, in a different way. So it's more, it's not like, it's, it's, it's trying to tackle it in, a, in one specific case. So we, we have one case that might be problematic, so, so we, can, um, we can work with the parents. <coughs> Another option is, uh, so there's two types of uh, protective. One of them would be stabilizing. So in this case, adoption, for instance, would be uh, because the child is no longer living with those parents. Um, and, uh, and the other one would be reactive with education programs. Um, so it's, again, it's like thinking we are not going to completely get rid of this, but let's, let's try to reduce the chances of, of, uh, of having it. And finally, challenging and inoculation. Um, so challenging is like we need the right level of conflict. So a little bit of um, conflict is required to be able to uh, protect the child. And finally, uh, the longitudinal approach is like there's going to be ups and downs. So we have to be able to anticipate the downs so that we can uh, provide protection before they start. So we, we try to smooth the line a little bit. Questions here 
or comments? Yes. So is that one kind of like saying, oh look, um, your friend did this wrong and he's on to that's what happened to you, kind of. Like, uh, yeah, you know, exactly. Just into it. Yeah, exactly. That's a very good example. Uh, it's being realistic as well, <coughs> so that uh, problems are going to be faced. Yeah. Um, so if you think about conditions, specific conditions again, uh, so I don't know, I'm all the time thinking about developmental language disorder, I, it's, it's just not. So, so, um, so yeah, if um, too much intervention, to put it like that, could be problematic because you have to leave the child experience uh, on her own or their, his own and, and, and face problems. And also, this is going to um, increase resilience because um, understanding that there are problems and that they can solve them is going to equip the child with these skills. Uh, so that's the challenging model. And, and I think the example you gave was very good. So, so yeah, yeah, this is happening. If you, if you don't do well, this is what's going to happen. Right, okay, so, um, so resilience uh, f can be also uh, understood in terms of processes. Um, so you've got a few examples there. Um, different, uh, some of them are at, at more individual level over the top. Some of them are at the more um, uh, community, social level uh, down there. Um, so, for instance, um, you could um, try to promote sports, try to promote exercise, more at the community level, but also train parents, um, train siblings, or uh, an intervention program at school to reduce something, whatever, uh, bullying, or uh, something to promote healthy eating, whatever, right? Uh, so it's going to be more about processes. You, you can understand it as one um, specific action in one specific point in time. Okay. Um, so, so just remember that protective factors are very similar to risk factors. They also work at these three levels of analysis, biological, environmental, and psychosocial. Um, and, um, and there's going to be a wide range of different interventions. So they are something that you could use to make your recommendations when you're writing. That's going to be perhaps more your um, kind of creative angle uh, when you're writing your professional report. Um, because you could say, well, on the basis of these um, studies, uh, these recommendations might be given, thinking about protective factors. Again, try to think about them as processes, not as specific actions, um, so that we can reduce um, the chances of one specific condition. So this is it, basically, uh, because next week we're going to be working with professional reports in the seminars. Um, I've given you two examples. So if you want to download them and read them for uh, next week, that would be good. They are not very long. I think they are like three, four pages long, each of them. We, we can read them during the actual session, um, but it's always good to read them ahead if you want. Um, think about these questions. So who who's written uh, that professional report, uh, whether it was clear or not, whether you found it uh, more or less clear. Um, were they empirically driven? Were they using evidence? Um, and also quite important because for your professional report, you have to uh, use a very applied angle. So was, was it more theoretical or more apply, applied? Uh, so the first one is on DLD. Um, so, so the seminar and the lecture were going to be a little bit in relation, not surprisingly. And finally, the um, second one is on dyslexia. Right. We're going to have three more examples of professional reports. Um, longer, but these two are brief, um, and we're going to be working with them in the seminars. Um, so this is it for today. So before we leave, any comments or questions? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes.
Yeah. yeah, yeah. For both tax one and tax two, you have to include prefixes. You are expected to use at least ten, eight, ten. Right. Uh, for the other one, tax two as well. For both. Okay. Oh, okay.